através dessa, desse nosso convênio, o convite para o é, um intercâmbio, gerar alguns, algumas é, conversas, projetos e, além disso, essa, esse workshop, participar desse workshop. Eu passo, portanto, a, a palavra para ele. Obrigado. Thank you to Dr. De Silva and to CTI for hosting me at this uh, excellent workshop. And I'm very much enjoying my first visit to South America and especially to Brazil. Uh, so I'm going to take a step back from the biological. Um, my expertise is machines. Uh, they're very general purpose machines. Uh, basically, I believe capable of making almost anything we want them to make uh, in, in ways that are perhaps more efficient than we've made things in the past. And uh, we'll give more people access to the power to build things than have ever had access to it in the past. So uh, this technology I'm talking about is additive manufacturing. That's the sort of official international standardized terminology to describe this technology. Um, but uh, colloquially, we call it 3D printing. Um, it used to be called rapid prototyping. It's also been called solid freeform fabrication, which was the term I used in my PhD thesis. Uh, and it's now out of date, and so I have to throw away my thesis. <laughs> um, but to get started, for those of you who are not familiar with additive manufacturing or 3D printing, the basic concept is that you uh, have in the computer a three-dimensional representation of the object you wish to build. Um, historically, this has just been the shape of the object. That's it, just the shape. There's some computer uh, algorithm which slices it into thin layers horizontally, thin planes. Within those planes, uh, some kind of path planning, some kind of uh, list of commands is generated to tell a machine how to deposit material to build up that thin slice. And then a machine actually executes these commands, uh, growing that layer and then growing one layer on top of another building the object up, and for instance, the object could be something like this uh, model of a car brake, disc brake. And then there's typically some post-processing where maybe some support material has to be removed. That's some material which keeps parts from touching each other or which supports overhanging areas. And there will be more videos which will make some of this clearer in a moment. There are a vast number of technologies that fit under this umbrella of additive manufacturing. And quite a few of them have been commercialized. I think, as was mentioned before, this technology started back in the 1980s, but it had precursors in the previous two centuries, you know, building topographic models and making uh, busts of humans from images, that sort of thing. But in the 1980s, uh, it first became a computerized process, and this was 3D systems, their stereolithography process. Um, and that's in here somewhere, SLA, stereolithography, which uses a laser on liquid uh, photo cross-linkable polymers to uh, draw one layer at a time, add more resin, draw another layer, builds it up. Um, but as you can see, a wide variety, work with a, vari a variety of different materials. And the trend over time has been from very delicate, fragile materials that you could just barely look at and appreciate the shape of something, just representation in physical reality, toward more and more useful uh, products where out of the machine came something you could put right into your car or you know build another machine from or these days put into a body um, through injection mold tooling mechanical parts um, actually now working with solid metals using high power lasers or um, electron beams to sinter together powder metals into solid metal objects and uh, into electronics and now multiple materials combining multiple functionalities in single objects, so uh, electrical, biological, chemical, mechanical functionality all printed into a single object. And that was the focus of my PhD work and some of what I'll be discussing today. Uh, here's some video, hopefully, well, there we go. These are some marketing videos, sort of demonstrate the basic concepts of the additive manufacturing processes. Um, Computer-aided representation, then a machine next door here. Machine interprets that command and basically just adds material, as opposed to the, the more classical approach of starting with a, a solid block of material and then carving away, you know, CNC milling. Um, so you see adding material to grow the objects up. And the different processes. So this is uh, stereolithography. This is selective laser sintering. I think there's an SLS or two LS, SLS machines here. Um, this is a 
polyjet system, which is the object. There's one of these machines here as well. And this is a, an electronics-oriented process from, uh, that came out of uh, United States Defense Department research, but is now commercial. So from 1985 through the present, it's really been the era of industrial additive manufacturing. These are big, expensive machines intended really for big corporations and research centers um, and not really accessible to the general public. Uh, really, uh, even today, very few people have heard about additive manufacturing or 3D printing. It's just starting to enter into the public consciousness. Uh, here's RCAM, for instance, uses the electron beam and powdered metals. It's a $1 million machine. Um, and it's, it's useful for a variety of purposes, but uh, very few people have access to these. Um, there's that one that was electronics oriented, depositing very, very fine lines of materials for, for instance, making photovoltaic cells with higher performance than has been possible in the past. Uh, this is a, a concept that's sort of on the verge of commercialization. This is 3D printing of complete houses. So where uh, concrete structures are, are printed out by a giant robot that just sort of deposits concrete where necessary. And uh, the concept even includes uh, putting in the wiring and the plumbing as the house is built up. And um, that's the luxury version. But the, uh, the sort of nearer term application of this is building emergency housing in case of uh, tsunami, for instance, you can build you know, concrete structures very quickly through this automated process. Um, and this is an example of sort of the trend from single material processes, these that sort of deposit one, one material at a time, build up objects of one material, one homogeneous structure, to uh, at least the notion of combining multiple materials within a single process to achieve more complex artifacts. In this case, um, this is sort of like an inkjet printer. It, it jets multiple different colors of resin. In, case the, in this case, the resin has uh, different stiffnesses after it's been cross-linked or polymerized. Um, and it enables you to create objects of sort of various shades of blue and gray, and each shade of blue or gray is a different stiffness. They're not independently controllable, however. You know, you're stuck with dark blue is always stiff, and white is always soft, or whatever the actual um, relationship is. Now, from 2001 to the present, there has been a, a very rapidly expanding market for personal additive manufacturing or personal 3D printing. And um, this is uh, around somewhere in here is where I come into the picture. Um, so the first work in this was the RepRap project. It's an open source hardware and software project. Uh, the first uh, web presence of this was 1999, but the, the first physical products that they had anybody, you know, anybody other than the inventors tinkering with was around 2001. And uh, nowadays, it's uh, $500 to $700 to build one of these. You can uh, scrounge together the parts yourself. Um, there are a few places where you can order a box of parts and assemble this. But this, this is a machine you assemble yourself. And then um, you tinker with it, essentially like uh, have to coax it to make functional parts. But it, it's, uh, it's using a fairly robust technology, and it can make strong plastic parts that they claim you can build many of the pieces of this machine with this machine. So you could partially duplicate this machine by using this machine. Um, Fab at Home, this is the machine that um, I was one of the inventors of, is uh, rather than using one material at a time, such as this or the previous ones, its focus was on trying to combine multiple materials and achieve multiple functionalities within a single object that was being produced. Um, again, our notion was social network, you know, try to harness the creativity of many people across the world to, uh, you know, help make this platform better, help explore new possibilities for this technology. Uh, <clears throat> so the, uh, the kit available for United States, and you can still buy these. It's around $2,500 to $3,700, depending on the options you select. Um, but it uses primarily a syringe extrusion process, so it's a, a syringe pump. Um, like you might find in a laboratory, well-controlled dispensing of fluids. Um, and in this case, you know, people always ask me, so what material, where do I buy the material? And I would say, your grocery store, uh, lab supply, hardware, whatever you want, anything that will squeeze out of a syringe, you can build objects from using this material, or this machine. Um, and there's some 400-ish of these machines around the world now. 
including one here at CTI. Uh, here's another example, Candy Fab. Uh, this one was more done for fun than for any kind of practical application, but it, uh, it uses hot air, a focused uh, jet of hot air to sinter together sugar and uh, make solid objects out of sugar. So it's a very large piece of candy. <laughs> Uh, but they have experimented with using like high density polyethylene, so plastics, thermoplastics. Um, very rough surfaces, but interesting shapes. Uh, this, this is the one that has garnered all the media attention in the United States, um, and I'm a bit jealous. Uh, and I got some media attention, but they've gotten a lot more. Um, and in fact, this is part of the reason why. So this is just a single material process. They're melting plastic wire. It's the fused deposition modeling process, the same that Stratasys Corporation in the United States uh, patented. Um, but last year, so in 2009, this company, which was a, a two or three gentlemen in uh, Brooklyn, New York, in a garage, um, sold 25% of all additive manufacturing systems ever sold in 2009, um, just with these low-cost machines. And that's because there's now a mass market. There's, consumers are interested in tinkering with these things in larger scale. So this is a, a couple thousand machines now. And they're quickly eclipsing the total number of other industrial additive manufacturing machines around the world. So more people are aware of this, more people understand the problems with the technology, and that's really the, the exciting goal. That's why I'm not too hurt by the success of this, because you know, the, the impetus behind my project was getting people excited about this and uh, drawing more intellectual capital into the advancement of this technology, and they're having great success. Uh, the corporations, the industrial additive manufacturing systems companies are aware of this and they've been responding by reducing the prices of their machines. So there's now uh, an inexpensive, relatively, 14,000, it's you know, five times more expensive, but still uh, you know, half the cost of their previous machine. Um, 3D Systems, that uh, first company with the $400,000 machines has a $10,000 machine. Uh, and the Chinese, um, like with uh, the Japanese in the 1980s when I was younger, are taking everything we do and making it cheaper and um, maybe better, maybe not better, but at least cheaper. Uh, so here's a $2,600 version of that MakerBot. A little bit well, more expensive, but a fancier version of it, more commercially appealing. And some example parts, which I'm not 100% sure they actually made these parts on this machine. <laughs> But uh, it's plausible. It's just plausible. Um, and as Vladimir Marinov uh, disclosed earlier today, and, and we just heard about recently, there is this uh, from Technical University of Vienna, this um, LED mask, active mask deposition process. A uh, very small machine. They say it's about this big. Uh, very impressive piece of work. And you see the very high resolution it's capable of. And I believe this, if this is a standard test piece that people build with these machines, there's a little spiral staircase inside there. And I believe they were able to achieve that. Um, so all very impressive. And you see all these different uh, technologies emerging. As the original industrial patents are expiring in the United States and, and globally, uh, more and more of these sort of inexpensive machines from hobbyists and from small startup companies are appearing on the market and opening up a lot of possibilities for exploring uh, bio applications as well as uh, other industrial and uh, hobby oriented artistic applications of this technology. Uh, this is leading to a new manufacturing economy um, in which the manufacturing is located at home rather than in a big factory floor somewhere. Uh, and ideas are transmitted through the internet uh, as to what products to build. You maybe pay 50 cents or a dollar to somebody for their idea, download it and build it on your machine, and they make 50 cents from 10,000 people. Um, but there are uh, networks, now intermediaries, that are popping up to uh, facilitate this, um, that sort of stand between the people with the ideas, uh, help them create a storefront and market their design, and then uh, form networks of people who own these inexpensive machines and sell them the jobs to run. You know, like we receive these jobs, we print these jobs, we ship it to somebody who we never know. Um, and uh, this uh, person in the middle, this company in the middle, takes a little piece of every transaction. So it's this whole economy.